child's will is broken, end quote. Some fundamentalist churches have made headlines for advocating the use of a specially manufactured rod in disciplining their children. You can get this on the internet. Um, from a news story reporting about this, parents who belong to the Bethel Baptist Church in El Sobrante are told in no uncertain terms, spank your children or oppose God's will. The church, which also runs the 200 student Bethel Christian Academy, discourages parents from using their hands and recommends using a rod or flexible stick to swat, it's, fair, it's a paddle, a fairly rigid, um, I should have had a photo of it, I'm sorry, a fairly rigid rubber, a flexible stick to swat their children until their will is broken. But an eight panel church pamphlet with corporal punishment instructions does caution against using instruments such as hairbrushes, cords, or two by fours. One uh, church father who is somewhat disturbed about this uh, cautions the following. He says, if parents do use corporal punishment, they so should also use other methods of discipline, such as timeouts and restrictions on activities. But the church, Bethel Church, quote, directs parents to spank for all disobedience because all other methods are not designed by God, end quote. Now, I want to be clear that, well, that I'm not Christopher Hitchens. Um, I want to be clear that I'm not trying to indict religion as a cause of child abuse. I would be remiss if I failed to mention that there are several committed religious organizations working actively to oppose such organizations as this church, Bethel Academy, which they regard as, quote, hateful and ungodly. The problem, however, is that Bethel parents are the ones who seem to have read the texts. Parental tyranny is all too godly. What exactly are the literalists supposed to have gotten wrong? It would no doubt make an interesting project, and certainly a challenging one, to construct an apologetic interpretation of the text to remake God into a humane and loving father. Moral judgment is non-monotonic. The addition of detail can always reverse the ethical valence. It's imaginable, then, that some set of interpolations to the stories I've been discussing could even redeem God. But what would be the point? If we all agree that beating, banishment, and death are not acceptable tools for disciplining children, let us acknowledge that we have come to know this despite and not because of scripture. I'd like to conclude by answering finally the main question I raised about the story in Genesis 2 and 3. What was the purpose of the prohibition? I think we can find a clear and simple answer in the text once we give up the, con the interpretive constraint that God must turn out to be good. The key, I think, is the serpent. His counterpart in the children's story is the character Hecate Peg. She is clearly depicted as someone up to no good, and you heard her voice. We see that she has grotesquely selfish reasons for deceiving the children and for inducing them to violate their mother's rules. She wants to eat them. The serpent, on the other hand, is not so clearly evil. He's never characterized as such. The Hebrew word to describe him is arum, which Ed Curley kindly pointed out to me, um, is defined in Brown, uh, Driver, and Briggs's Hebrew and English lexicon of the Old Testament um, to mean, among other things, sensible. Um, many English translations render that word as subtle. That's the, um, um, what is that? Oh, that's uh, James, um, um, Got it backwards. James Kugel's translation, uh, crafty, that's the revised uh, New Standard Version, or cunning, that's the Art Scrolls translation. Although each one of these English terms can carry negative connotations, they can also carry positive ones. We're given no hint as to why the serpent would want to mislead Adam and Eve. He appears to have nothing to gain from getting the two human beings to disobey God. Most significantly, the serpent does not mislead Adam and Eve. Hecate Peg is a liar. The story makes this clear. She promises the children she will give them gold if they do what she asks, but we see that this was never her intention. In contrast, every detail in Genesis, if taken at face value, testifies that the serpent tells the truth. Everything the serpent tells Eve turns out to be true. Adam and Eve do not die when they eat the forbidden fruit, 
they do gain knowledge, and tellingly, God is worried about their becoming like him. The serpent's explanation of God's motives is spot on. God is trying to preserve a divine prerogative, to keep his gardeners away from the source of his most valuable power. God later admits as much. Quote, then the Lord God said, see, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever, end quote. The serpent's view makes sense to Eve and her own observations add further proof. Quote, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. Now the tree's name, as I've already noted, seems an additional clue for the reader and may also have been one for Eve. What about the effects of eating from the tree? We learn that Adam and Eve do undergo some kind of shift in epistemic power. Their, quote, eyes were opened and they realized they were naked. Conventional interpretations read this passage as saying that Adam and Eve realized that they had done something wrong, that the subsequent covering is an act of shame. But this reading is hardly mandated by the text. And here I am going to get a little bit speculative. Here's an alternative reading. Perhaps the new epistemic power Adam and Eve have acquired is the power to see the normative dimension of things. Perhaps they now apprehend that they are not merely animals, that they are moral as well as natural beings. Natural conditions like nakedness have now acquired meaning. Clothing signifies their new status. Perhaps they suppose, as the serpent does, that this new power is so valuable that it is worth risking everything for, worth incurring the wrath of the most powerful being in the universe. And perhaps it is. Thank you. We now have a reply from Professor Eleanor Stump, um, teaches at St. Louis University and well known for her work in philosophy of religion and medieval philosophy. In her paper, Professor Anthony has issued an indictment of God. He is a terrible parent. He is physically and psychologically abusive to human beings. Her paper is the answer to the question that is the paper's title, Does God Love Us? Certainly not, is Anthony's answer. What's more, she says, anyone who suggests that we ought to love him is displaying the psychology of an abused child. Her evidence for this thesis is a concatenation of stories, readings and interpretations of stories in the Hebrew Bible. She begins with her interpretations of stories of Adam and Eve and interweaves that interpretation with a variety of shorter or longer interpretations of many other stories. The summing of all the interpretations of these stories is meant to give a damning picture of God. I want to begin by saying that in very many things, I agree with Anthony. <clears throat> Here's a partial, not a complete list of those things based on the long version of her paper. She omitted some of these things in the reading draft. <clears throat> it's okay. I agree that not all authority is legitimate and that not all disobedience is bad. Children are not the property of their parents and certain kinds of acts and practices on the part of parents vitiate some or even all of the obligations t children typically owe their parents. Mutatis mutandis, these points, these points also apply to God. It's not true in the case of God that God has a right to do anything at all to human beings or that anything God does counts as good just because it's God who does it. And in general, it's not right for any person, even a divine person, to use a human being just as a means to some other end and with no care for that human being's own well-being. In addition, I share Anthony's affect about these things. Abuse of children is loathsome. Cruelty to human persons at any age is too. It's worth being passionate about these things, as she obviously is. <clears throat> 